Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our multi-platform service for the Unitarian Church of Staten Island. We're so glad for all of you joining us, both online and in person. Um, for those joining in person, we welcome you to join us for hospitality through those doors after the service. And uh, those joining online, we hope you take a moment to introduce yourselves in the chat box. And after service, you're invited to fellowship with one another in a virtual coffee hour. Um, a reminder, our visiting member, Ember Kelly, has regular office hours on Saturday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. To schedule a meeting, please email Ember at minister at uucsi.org. Uh, see the weekly newsletter for more info on that. Weekly gatherings include our women's group via Zoom held every Tuesday from 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, you can see Kathy uh, for that. Do you want to raise your hand, Kathy? Um, maybe we all know this, but why not, um, about the women's meeting. And actually, you probably all know Kathy, well, except for Michael. Um, and now uh, the men's meetings, uh, see Tom for that. That's also on Zoom, it's sometimes in person, actually. We have to update this, Tom, every Monday evening. Um, and since I see Janice here, if pe people express interest in the spiritual growth circle, she's going to try to continue that at her home once a month for a, f a few weeks, I mean, a few months. So you can see Janice if you're interested in that. Um, announcements about today, there'll be a membership meeting at 1245 in the vestry following the service. And lastly, please support our social media outreach. Please like and share our weekly posts on Facebook and Instagram. And remember, all of our services are on YouTube. Um, and now we gently remind you to silence your mobile devices if you're joining us in person and let us prepare for this morning's service. For our opening words, um, I selected them from the UU hymnal. So if you'd like to open it to page 418. Um, and I thought, why not do this kind of call and response, or I don't know if that's quite the right term, but I'll read the first sentence, you all read the second sentence, and I'll read the last sentence. How does that sound? More participation. Um, I'll, I'll allow people a moment to turn to 418 if you want to follow along. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not, yeah, it's number 418. All right. Um, come into the circle of love and justice. Come and you shall know peace and joy. And now I invite you to join me in lighting our chalice. You can find the affirmation in our order of service. We light this chalice in the search for truth and the spirit of love. We unite in worship and fellowship. And as an extension of lighting our chalice, I want to take a moment of silence to light these candles for some of the names of those who have recently been affected by police brutality. We cannot cover all of the names of those affected, but this morning we light a candle for the life of Roger Fortson, for the life of Kendall Floyd Wood Woodard, and for the life of Blake Robert Fleur. May these lights be a symbol of our commitment to continue the work of racial justice and to proclaim that black lives matter. And now please join us in singing hymn number 300 with heart and mind in your gray hymnal. Please stand as you're able.
Now is the time in our service for joys and sorrows. If you're visiting us for the first time, uh, you could introduce yourselves now if you'd like. And for those gathering in person, we invite you to raise your hand and then stand where you're seated. Um, I will pass this microphone around so you can share your joy or sorrow. We invite you to share what's in your heart this morning. For those joining online, we invite you to type into the chat your joys or sorrows, at which point Eric and John will lead them, uh, read them aloud. We also invite you to share what's in your heart. So would anybody, anybody like to share this morning? It's Ryan. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ryan. I've been back for nearly a month. Um, so I concluded my third year in college with Staten Island. And also, I'm headed to my senior year in later this summer in August. So, yeah, and I have a lot of opportunities headed my way. So just letting you know. Congratulations. Hi, my name is Alec, and um, my joys are I just finished a semester at the same college as my man Ryan, and um, we just finished our semesters. Looks like I got an A and a B, and I'm waiting on one more grade, but the professor said it should be an A. Um, and my sorrow is definitely um, with the Palestinian people. Uh, thank you. Good morning, I'm Sarah. My joy this morning is that my, my granddaughter, Brianna, who's 16, uh, has now is now a driver. She got her learner's permit. So I'm very proud of her. In the meantime, I'm also very frightened <laughs> with all the crazy drivers around. So I wish her luck. Thank you. As most of you know, Carolyn is recovering from cancer. She's been attending church. She's not here today but it's for a very good reason. Again, as most of you know, we present free outdoor concerts throughout the summer, and we weren't sure whether we could do it this year because Carolyn does 90% of the work to make it happen. So from her bed, including from the hospital bed when she had surgery a year ago, she's been working on grant proposals and then doing, signing everything up. I hope you've noticed in the, uh, the hall the last couple of Sundays, we've had postcards which list the dates the programs were giving. So yesterday was the first program. And Carolyn is not in any shape to play her French horn yet, but she wanted to attend, and she did. And it was absolutely wonderful. Like the whole audience, it seemed, like lined up to greet her. And even all the band members lined up to greet her because although they'd heard from her on the phone, no one had seen her basically for a year. So uh, it was wonderful, it was wonderful. She completely wore herself out, so she's not here this morning, but she'll be back next week. Glad to hear, thank you, Kevin. So first I would like to um, read one of the joys and sorrows in the chat. So Chris Johnson says that while she's had two negative COVID tests, she was exposed a week ago and figured to play it safe, so that's why she's on Zoom. And I have actually my own joy. So the the past two weekends, um, John and I have been doing like musical activities. So two weeks ago, we went to the Scottish String Fling, which is a music. Oh, <laughs> wait. So the Scottish String Fling, which is a music camp. Um, um, at the Ashokan Center where we played Scottish folk music. And uh, one weekend ago, we, um, um, sorry, we, we um, performed in our orchestra in like a Stat Staten Island borough-wide orchestra, and we performed at our violin teacher's annual recital. So it was fun. We miss you, Chris, and thank you, Eric. And obviously, I said, happy to hear Carolyn had such a great time yesterday, but sad that she's not joining us today. Um, anyone else would like to uh, share a joy or a sorrow this morning? 
right. Thank you for sharing your joys and sorrows and for those held silently in your hearts this morning. And now we'll pause for meditation. I will offer a prompt to focus our meditation and ring the bell. At that point, I invite you to begin meditation with three deep breaths. After a few minutes, I will ring the bell again to mark the end of our time. Today's prompt from Thich Nhat Hanh is as follows. If we are at war with our parents, our family, our society, or our church, there is probably a war going on inside us also. So the most basic work for peace is to return to ourselves and create harmony among the elements within us, our feelings, our perceptions, and our mental states. That is why the practice of meditation, looking deeply, is so important. Hi, I think that's a beautiful mantra to go along with our meditation. <laughs> and 
And I will give Michael DeVito Jr. a proper introduction in a few minutes, but for now he will come and uh, offer today's reading for us. Hello, everyone. And to the little one, hi. Uh, this is a poem by Leonard Cohen, A Street. I used to be your favorite drunk, good for one more laugh. Then we both ran out of luck. Luck was all we ever had. You put on a uniform to fight the Civil War. You looked so good, I didn't care which side you were fighting for. Wasn't all that easy when you up and walked away, but I'll save that story for another rainy day. I know the burden's heavy as you will it through the night. Some people say it's empty, but that doesn't mean it's light. You left me with the dishes and a baby in the bath. You're tight with their militias. You wear their camouflage. You always said we're equal, so let me march with you. Just an extra in the sequel to the old red, white, and blue. Baby, don't ignore me. We were smokers. We were friends. Forget that tired story of betrayal or revenge. I see the ghost of culture with numbers on his wrists, salutes some new conclusion that all of us have missed. I cried for you this morning, and I'll cry for you again. But I am not in charge of sorrow, so please don't ask me when. There may be wine and roses and Magnus of champagne, but we'll never know. We'll never ever be that drunk again. Okay, the party's over, but I've landed on my feet. I'm standing here on this corner where there used to be a street. Thank you, Michael. And now is a time in our service where we take an offering. We know it's the gifts of all of us that help us support our ability to thrive and to gather. For those attending in person, we'll pass the collection plate. Please use the envelope you'll find in the pew. Write your name and indicate if your offering is part of your pledge or donation. For those online, links and instructions will be posted in the chat. You can mail us a check or donate through the PayPal giving page on our website. Please give as generously as you can. Our offerings will now be greatly received.
So before I introduce Michael, um, like we did last week, we'll have a, a Q and A um, after his talk. So um, telling you beforehand. So if you have any questions for Michael, you can save them and ask at the end of his talk. Um, so Michael DeVito Jr. graduated from Staten Island St. Peter's High School before enlisting in the United States Marine Corps in 1991, where he ultimately attained the, the rank of Staff Sergeant. Having achieved a BA in Asian Studies while in service, he matriculated towards a Master's of Education and recently earned a Compassion Systems Master's Practitioner Certificate and an Advanced certif Certification in Holding Spaces from the Center for Systems Awareness. Returning home in 05, Michael began working for the New York Center for Interpersonal Development, or NICID, where he first worked with At Promise youth, helping them to earn a high school diploma before working there in various roles, including currently as their executive director. Michael's commitment to community service is evident in his involvement in various collective impact projects and coalitions. He sits on the steering committees for tackling youth substance abuse, Equity Alliance of Staten Island and Youth, WINS, which is the Workforce Initiative Network of Staten Island, which he founded and he chairs. He also contributes to the New York Training and Education Association Board and is a member of NYATEP, DEIAB Board, the Advisory Board for Visions, Services for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and is a Vice President of the Staten Island Running Association. Um, I believe you guys have a race tomorrow morning. Is that you? Memorial Day, if anyone's interested, you can see Michael after the service. Uh, <laughs> um, in a 2015 American Express Nonprofit Leadership Academy alumni, Michael was inducted into the New York State Senate Veterans Hall of Fame in 2017 for his service after military service. He's a Kwanian, a grassroots community group, Occupy the Block member, a 240 marathon runner. I'm particularly impressed with that, um, as, as well as everything else. Um, a published short story writer and a former candidate for US Congress. I feel a little funny because a 240 marathon is, is you know, a hobby and everything else, you're doing good for the community. And I have to comment on the 240. It's just, it's just really fast. I, I couldn't help myself. Um, Michael resides in Westerly, Staten Island with his wife and childhood sweetheart, Natalie, and their daughter, Maya. Please welcome Michael DeVito, Jr. Hello there. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see some familiar faces, some folks I haven't seen in a while. And uh, I want to just take a moment to thank my brother David for uh, giving me this opportunity to speak with you all. And um, also to just, you know, pause for a moment and acknowledge um, the war and the suffering and the death uh, that is being experienced. Uh, around the world, uh, particularly for the people of Palestine. Uh, so, it's like there is nothing funny about peace, love, and understanding, right? <laughs> uh, so I am Michael DeVito, Jr., and uh, as my bio shares all sorts of stuff about me, um, it doesn't share that I'm dyslexic. Uh, it doesn't share that, my goodness, do I crave social approval. I am just terrified of rejection, you know? Uh, it also doesn't share that uh, when I'm in conflict, I seek to accommodate people because I cannot stand for anyone to be angry, particularly at me. Uh, and that coupled with a incredible imposter syndrome is the man that stands before you here today, you know? Um, I wanna first, I think, make a, dis a little dis uh, distinction uh, between Memorial Day and Veterans Day. The other day I was on the phone uh, with my CEO, uh, and as we were getting uh, finishing up the call, she said to me, I don't know what to say to you on Memorial Day. Uh, and I said, nothing. I am still here, right? Uh, let's, let's together remember those uh, who aren't, you know? Um, and I guess I want to share uh, in, in a way it's... Uh, like sort of in the language that I've come to know uh, over my time um, is that um, for some, uh, they cashed a check. Uh, America cashed a check. Uh, and I'll say more about that in, in just a bit. 
Um, so when Dave asked me to speak, um, initially it was like, oh my goodness, I don't know what I'm going to say. Uh, and in deep reflection, lots of running in the green belt, uh, I sort of distilled what I aim to share uh, down to this phrase, which is that tradition influences who we become. And to start off, I kind of want to just sort of say, what is a tradition? And is it nothing really more than actions that we take that are based upon beliefs that are derived from past actions of those that have come before us? So when I was a kid and my parent let me open up a gift at midnight on Christmas Eve, uh, that was a tradition in my family that was added to the greater tradition of Christmas. And maybe you had that experience and maybe you, maybe you didn't. And I dare say that I remember those gifts more than any one that I did on Christmas morning. So there's something to that, you know? And some traditions, they have gone on for millennia and we maybe don't even realize that they're a tradition. It feels almost like a routine. And yet others, uh, those that we might have created with our immediate family, um, seem much more intimate and much more real to us. So maybe um, you might have chosen recently to start taking your mom to a particular restaurant on Mother's Day and after a few years that's kind of a tradition. Uh, and Recently, the DeVitos, uh, around the COVID time, decided that we were going to no longer give gifts on special days, that we were going to give time, and we were going to find things to do as a family, and that we would spend that time together, and maybe it would consist of a show or a museum or a walk in the park, and it would be something that we were all committing to. Um, and that's kind of our tradition that just has come to be. Uh, last night, in fact, we took uh, my Natalie to see uh, water for elephants in honor of Mother's Day. So what is Memorial Day? Originally, it was Decoration Day. Uh, it started just after uh, the Civil War, where coincidentally, more Americans died than in any other war, obviously, for obvious reasons. Uh, and a leader of a uh, veterans group, a general that was serving in that war, uh, named Decoration Day the 30th of May. Uh, and this is around 1868. Um, what many don't know is that's, of course, not the whole story, because that's not how traditions become to be. Uh, the whole story, or at least more of the story, uh, is that it's sort of unclear exactly when folks began to come together to honor those that had passed in war. Uh, some records say that the earliest Memorial Day commencements was uh, with a group of formerly enslaved people in Charleston, South Carolina, less than a month after the Confederacy surrendered in 1865. And it takes like 30 odd years for sort of the nation to get behind that. It's, the 18, it's 1890 before they decide that it's going to be now Decoration Day will be Memorial Day. Uh, and it becomes this moment where people come together uh, annually. Uh, there are community-wide events. Uh, people, uh, businesses close. Uh, residents begin to decorate. Uh, and it takes on more of the feel that maybe we know, we know today. Um, there have been, of course, a great many wars uh, since then. Uh, and those <clears throat> that um, now observe every Monday in May uh, do so in, in even more, uh, in, in many other ways. Um, moments of silence, visits to graveyards, parades, running races, uh, to which there is one tomorrow, church observances. Uh, and tomorrow at Brookfield Park, um, that's... 45 years old, so the 46th time they'll tow the line, and maybe there'll be some runners and family out there who are starting their tradition with going to the Memorial Day race uh, each year. So what you might notice here, uh, I guess maybe the theme that I'm trying to drive home, uh, is that it is really in 
the small groups. It is in the everyday that we sort of honor these traditions. And while they may be more global, and maybe as we have been a more global society, and we sort of feel like the everyday gets confused and mashed up with everything, that really it's this that is the tradition and the way that we're honoring uh, each of us. And for those that have lost their lives or have had their lives taken. So when I tell folks that I was in the Marines, they often will say to me, no way, you? Uh, you seem so chill and so kind. <laughs> uh, and I will normally say something fun back like, you know, you should have seen me then. And that's not exactly true. Um, the truth is that I became a Marine for kind of reasons that I really didn't understand. Uh, I was influenced by some people that were immediately in my sphere that were able to help me to be of service to me. Um, and in my evolution, this is how I became deeply invested in being in service uh, to others. So the influences were two and a half, really. Uh, the first was a teacher. Uh, which direction should I point? Kind of this way, not far from here. Um, a teacher, a former police officer, a Marine veteran who was drafted uh, into the Vietnam War, who made his way back to be of service. Um, and this Mr. Williams saw this scrawny 15-year-old kid hiding behind a smile, a little charm, a little bit of mischief, the fact that he had been abused, the fact that he could not read, and that he was terrified of anyone finding out those two things. And this man, tough as he was, stern as he was, direct as he was, handed me a book about the Battle of Gettysburg called The Killer Angels, and he said that he was going to help me read this whole book. And he did. And he encouraged me uh, to do other things, to run more, uh, to join the student council because he said I had a gift of gab. I could talk to people. Uh, and even though I didn't think that I was very smart, he insisted that I would be good at it. And the next was a man named Sergeant Lockett who was on a school trip in Colbskill, New York, um, a place where I felt like I had no business being. Um, it was a place where the government came together to talk to the student governments, and the Marines were there to bring us from point A to point B, and of course also to recruit us, because that's part of how the system works. Um, and here I was, sort of like this G.I. Joe kid um, who was watching cartoons about G.I. Joe, who liked comic books because I couldn't read, and therefore I could look at the pictures and kind of get a sense of what was going on. Uh, and I was holding out with this, hanging out with this older crowd, and they had combat boots on, and there was this one dude named Fred who said he was going to join the Marines. And he was this big, muscular guy, and I was this scrawny kid, and that is who Sergeant Lockett was. He was this rail-thin, lean Marine who was very witty, who was charming, who I connected to, and who said that I would be a good Marine. So this tradition of going upstate, which I checked they're not doing anymore, so sometimes traditions run out, um, influenced me. And what I didn't know at the time, that I do now believe, uh, it was sort of the genesis of where I started to recognize that I was a helper. Uh, that I understood that in order to be most happy that I was going to serve other people. So I joined the Marines as soon as they would let me, uh, not knowing absolutely at all what I thought I, what I was getting myself into. And that spring, I uh, had to convince my mom and dad to sign papers indeed, um, and that spring there was a ceremony for the student council and everyone got a beautiful plaque from the borough president and we went on stage, and they were asking everyone what they were doing, where they were going to college. And I said, I am joining the Marines. And it was more silent in that room at that moment than it was here now. <laughs> everyone was kind of looking at me like, what, what does that even mean? Uh, and I remember thinking, you all don't understand what I'm about to do in service of my country, in service of you know, my community. 
somehow I think I did, and maybe I did not actually, traditions are influenced by those that you know and who it influences who you become. In boot camp, Desert Storm began. So you could imagine uh, that the drill instructors took their opportunity to go way stronger and way harder on the recruits because now things were changing. Uh, we hadn't been in any sort of skirmish or any sort of conflict uh, since the early 80s in Beirut. Uh, and this was a moment where we were no longer going to be at peace. Um, arguably, you could say that that was the moment that for the United States of America, a lot of things changed uh, as the way that we began to police the world globally. Uh, and at that time is where I learned that there was a phrase that when I joined the Marines, I was actually writing a blank check to the United States of America, to all of you, and that possibly that check was going to be cashed. And what that meant was that potentially I would cash that check with my life, that I would give my life in service to the greater good of the United States of America. And thankfully, that check for me was never cashed because after that moment, largely we were at peace uh, for the entire time that I was in the Marines. Though uh, some of my brothers and sisters who stayed longer than I um, cashed that check. And that's unfortunate. Thankfully, Mr. Williams, his check wasn't cashed because he influenced me. He contributed to the person uh, that would one day, um, you know, stand here and share his experience. So, at some point during my service, I think I started to understand, I don't think, I suppose I know, that my independent views were much different than the Marine independent views. Uh, and what I began to see is that what I loved about being a Marine was not what I loved while I was a Marine. And it was definitely time to move on. Maybe you could say that the Michael, that Michael, and the one that stands before you here today had a much different view on war. More like Leonard, I dare to say that I joined, but they don't know what side I'm fighting for. So the young poor kid who kind of knew that he needed to get, how to get away of the riffraff, of the fear of somebody finding out about that abuse, this young man who ran away with all of his influences and his experiences and the tradition had become. And still, there were so more many lessons to learn before now, before today more time before I would return to the United States to see my hometown for the first time and to be really understanding of the type of service that I feel I'm destined here to give, compassionate service, loving service, service with deep presence. And an awareness of how, if we're not careful, those traditions can very quickly become routine. And we sort of forget what it is that we're doing here. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Michael. Do you want to stay up here, and we'll we'll do the Q and A now? Does anybody um, have any thoughts? Yes, Ryan. One second. Two questions and a comment. Well, first a comment. That was a great um, sermon. Uh, two questions. Will they have races for Memorial Day and Labor Day at the same time? and also telethon for Labor Day and Memorial Day in the near future in states to come or? 
Sure. Well, I think for runners, thank you very much, Ryan. It's good to see you. And I think for runners, give them any opportunity to have a race they'll put one on. Uh, so yes, there is uh, a race on both Memorial Day and also on Labor Day. Uh, and tomorrow it's at Brookfield Park, which is on Amboy. Amboy Road, I think. I forget. <laughs> yeah. South Shore, right? South, it is the South Shore. Yeah, I can give you the details afterwards. And you can come and walk, too. You don't have to run. Uh, I'm David Jones. Um, and uh, Mike, it's good to see you after so long. Uh, get those things out of the way. Um, I have been wondering um, where you were on the uh, political scene these days. Uh, I think we missed a fine opportunity to elect you and uh, bring in a congressperson who would have our interest at heart. The, uh, my question to you, or my comment slash question, is uh, your evolution from ignorant child to the person you are today. Uh, along the way, uh, you've picked up uh, a lot of understanding. We've, uh, we've been miseducated from youth generally. Uh, we don't, uh, we, I, when I say we, I'm talking about the collective we, uh, don't seem to understand our government, how our government works and how it works in, in, uh, in uh, uh, connection with the rest of the so-called free world and what our role truly is. For example, the Marine Corps, in my view, is the spearhead of this colonial settled, uh, settler uh, attitude, uh, which is an outgrowth, again, of the papal bull and whatnot. The, uh, we had this week a very fine a uh, uh, book uh, gathering uh, run by uh, Ganin uh, Khalil, which who, whom you also know, he being a former Marine. And uh, the Marine, again, once, this is just my point of view, but the Marines generally have a, uh, are, are searching for uh, uh, something within themselves. They're evolving themselves from something to something. Some get stuck along the way and some evolve and actually make a contribution. And many young people I've talked to today uh, who are involved in the military want to make a real deal contribution. They really want to get something done. They want to do something for others. So I, all that preamble to uh, ask, <clears throat> I know your work, can, you know, you, you continue to do that work with the young people and of this. I'm both grateful and proud of you for do, the, doing the work Thank that you. you're doing. Um, uh, but you, uh, I'd like you to comment on your personal involvement and your understanding of what our government is about and what, tr and, and uh, offer, uh, if you can, um, anything that might, um, bring about a broader understanding amongst uh, the general public, you know, that which you serve. Sure, sure. Uh, so first I would say uh, what I learned about running for office was to not do it again. <laughs> uh, and I just feel uh, so uh, very I'm humbled by your statement, David, thank you. Uh, and it's so good to see both of you. To say that uh, my work with NYSID in helping young people uh, learn how to self-regulate and to effectively communicate through conflict and to really um, understand themselves um, is, has become everything to me. Um, and while that might feel very um, singular, uh, it feels to me like everything because if we can just help everyone be able to communicate through conflict, we would not have the kind of conflict that we have in the world today. Uh, and uh, my journey and my awareness or my, my uh, sort of, I think, maybe ability to understand 
uh, I think was really that kid that was on the stage who kind of felt like I knew I was different and didn't know how. And I thought at the time that that difference was, well, I'm going to go fight for the, for the United States of America. And actually, there was something else in there. It was that I'm a helper. And I, I, I aim to help anyone that I can, you know. Um, and it was through the experiences in the military becoming like very close to people uh, that I would have maybe never had a chance to, uh, seeing different cultures, uh, being with people who did not look like me or talk like me, uh, that I started to really recognize that, you know, how beautiful the world is, how different the world is. It's the reason why my first uh, degree was in Asian studies, because when I got to Okinawa, Japan, I was so marveled by the culture that I just immersed myself, you know, in the culture uh, and learned everything that I could. Um, and what I think about young people today and how we're sort of in many ways doing them a disservice is we're not asking them what they want uh, or how they want things to go. Um, we kind of sort of nod hats to that and we're really not willing to go on the journey and to take the time to, re to truly invest in, in that process. Um, so instead what we do is we ask a couple of questions and then we get really angry that they're not like understanding fast enough. Um, and then we look at that as though they're being apathetic um, and often we think about voters in that way. We think, well, the voters don't want to come out and vote because they're apathetic. Um, and really, we're not giving them a reason to, to be excited about being in community. Um, and when we give them, um, or when we ask the right questions, and we ask them to kind of envision the world that they want to be in, um, to show up for the things that they feel are important, it's an incredible experience to see them just thrive. You know, um, we need more opportunities in in our communities, in our schools, to be able to offer. You know that um, we need more time. Uh, in my view, like the fact that we are still going to school at eight o'clock in the morning and finishing at three in the afternoon, like makes no sense in the modern era. Um, and you know, I could kind of go, go on all day long about the different policies that sort of affect that. And um, not to go too far into the weeds, uh, to just say that I am fortunate that I wake up every morning and I get to go ask those questions and that I work for an organization that is devoting the time to those ends, to allow that time to be without judging a young person or assuming uh, that they um, you know, can just get it together with a little bit of help, you know? What, uh, what job or experiences did you have in the Marines that pointed you towards doing service? Well, that's a great question. So I started to realize that I was smarter than I was when I got into the Marine Corps because I had a certain number of aptitudes that were around that speaking and uh, that sort of like uh, sort of like an innate ability to lead in a way that people kind of connected with me. I connected with other people really well. Um, and because of that, even though I was, uh, I thought I wanted to be a mechanic. Um, so I joined and I chose to be a mechanic because I, you know, scored just well enough on the test to choose that. Um, and uh, I, be, while I was in that school, um, I, I graduated at the top of the class and they allowed us to pick any place that we wanted to go for our duty station. So I was still wanting to be at home because I had a girlfriend, Jeanette Filipina Maria Capolino. Um, so of course I would want to be near her. Um, so I chose the closest duty station, which was Headquarters Marine Corps at the Pentagon. And I got there and it was non-tactical. So I wound up being in a dress uniform, driving around all of these dignitaries, uh, one being the Commandant of the Marine Corps, um, the personal driver for the, at the time, Sergeant Major Archibald Overstreet, who was the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps. And it was there that this sort of like way in which people were interacting and the sort of like the pomp and circumstance of things 
um, kind of got ingrained in me. So when I was then stationed in Okinawa um, a number of years later and put back in a tactical environment, I was like, I was the prim and proper Marine, like literally on the poster board, you know? And to be put in that environment, they were like, oh, wait a minute, we, we have a job for you. So I was made the platoon sergeant. And the platoon sergeant takes care of everyone, right? Make sure that everybody's needs are being met. So start to see, to see the pattern here, right? Uh, and from there, uh, there was a, a, a first sergeant, uh, first sergeant Larry, uh, Larry Brock, who was a short-term tackle for the Redskins in the early 70s. And he was like, you're gonna be the sergeant of the company. So he brought me up to the company. And so I took this trajectory of the next thing I know, I was the sergeant of arms. I was doing all of these things that were around leadership and making sure you have a need, I need to help you. And all of these things influenced the way in which I connected with people. And then because I was at that top level and I was listening and hearing the security briefs and listening to the way the things were being decided, I started to feel like, wow, this is not, this is not good for me. This is not who I am, you know? Um, by then I was sort of like meditating in, and, and chanting and doing all these things in Okinawa and I had just a completely different sort of worldview, you know? Uh, so yeah, so that was this trajectory of starting out thinking that I was gonna, you know, break tires and, and fix Humvees and winding up in a dress uniform and sort of listening and learning to talk to people. Thank you. Um, I saw two hands at once, so I'll, it's always closer. Um, Can you say again what NYCID is? Oh, NYCID, New York Center for Interpersonal Development. We are your mediation center. Uh, thank you, Hi. Mike. All right, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Sally Jones, and I uh, wanted to ask you a little bit about your experience in Okinawa. I had a brief conversation with you, I met your daughter, uh, and um, we, I guess you know that Okinawa is still a very, very um, critical place in terms yes. of the U.S. military. Yes. But in terms of the Okinawan people, yes. they are so oppressed by the U.S. military. Yes. And um, they, they do have a Memorial Day to themselves. Yes. Uh, um, I think it's coming up in June where all these people lost their lives in World War II. And... Um, so there's a lot of Memorial Days. I was just yes. thinking when you were talking, if we could list all the Memorial Days around the world for all the different wars, wow, it'd probably be fill up the calendar yes. a few times over. But anyway, I wanted to just ask you about your thoughts about Okinawa and mm. um, your experience there and, and how sure. you feel about what's happening now in Okinawa. Sure. Uh, so coinc uh, coincidentally, the reason why May the 30th was originally chosen was because there was not a Civil War battle on that particular day, which you would think is sort of like near impossible. So indeed, if we did collect all of the days, there probably would not be a day where someone somewhere is not trying to remember uh, those that they had lost. Okinawa is, uh, I lived there for 12 years and came to know Okinawa in a very, very intimate way. Um, my daughter uh, is uh, Okinawan. Um, her mom uh, is uh, native Okinawan. And being immersed there for so long and really sort of coming to see how um, the effects of war uh, and the way that policy and uh, occupation occur um, is that it really is everywhere. Uh, and it's present in almost at every street light because there's a gate everywhere uh, that is you know, keeping the Okinawan people out uh, and the military people in, in some ways. Um, and that, um, that presence of sort of like that, there's a weight that's in that presence. 
Um, and it sort of affects every aspect of the connections that you're making. Um, and because Japan is a very homogenous place um, at large, the Okinawan people are very much other from the mainland, the mainland folks. Um, and that is another layer of it because 85% of the military in Japan is actually in Okinawa, on Okinawa, uh, which is an incredible number, given the fact that Okinawa is such a small space, a place, not much bigger than Staten Island, really. Um, and there's most certainly much less land that's, that's habitable uh, there. Uh, so being there, I think that there are sort of like two ways. There are some that come to understand it and sort of embrace it and are aware of how that affects the people that are around them. Um, and then there are those that are very resistant to it. Um, not indifferent to the way that we are either tolerant or not tolerant of each other here. Um, and what I think is most remarkable about Okinawa um, is that because it's an island, it feels very, very, very strong. Um, and that there is such a, there's such a need for it to go back, to, to allow it to go back. And, the military, of course, has, you know, lots of overtures, has given some land back, most certainly, you know, it's never going to be enough until it's all back. Um, and, you know, those seem, I think, for some folks to feel, like, to feel like wins. And yet, what we know is that there are lots of protests. Um, there is more and more political dividing happening in the, in the Japanese government. Um, and I think that generally the military, the U.S. over there, even though I haven't been back in a, in, in a while, it's a much different place than it was even just a decade ago in the way in which the military is interacting with the local population, um, which I don't particularly think is very good because it's become more segregated uh, than it has ever been, um, which, because it starts to feel like those gates mean more than they've ever meant before. Um, really hard to get people to even listen and like one another if they're not talking at all, you know. My daughter goes back once a year um, to be with her family, uh, and she's often sort of reported back that um, it does feel like it's kind of going to boil over, that it's going to, there'll be a tipping point at some point soon. Um, I don't know what that'll look like. Uh, and, of course, as things get more difficult in other areas of the world, particularly in the Middle East, um, it doesn't seem like it's gonna, the problem's going to go away anytime soon. Hi. Um, I don't know how much benefits you may have received when, when you detached from the service, but I know that there was tremendous, tremendous problems among the servicemen who have gone out in the last 20 years from service, problems with substance abuse, mental health issues, physical health issues, homelessness. What, do you, what more do you think could be done on a national policy level to, to, to deal with these problems? Yes. Uh, well, first, to just acknowledge that fact, um, and while there is, um, you know, they say that 22 veterans die every day, um, that some of those statistics are a little cloudy in my understanding of that the, uh, the, the mantra is sort of that they're committing suicide every day, uh, 22. Um, and while that figure is real, it may not always be, it may not always be by suicide. Um, and to just acknowledge that any number is an astronomical number um, and that so many military uh, folks leave the military um, without a safety net, um, without very much transition. Um, my own experience was I went to a briefing on like a Wednesday, and on Monday I was no longer in service. Um, so it's sort of like you sit at this briefing and they tell you all of these things sort of in rapid fire, um, and then you're kind of like left, you know. Um, now, my choice was to get out of the service in, in Okinawa so that I could be a dad to my daughter. Um, and I, I surmise, though, that c coming back to New York would have probably felt similar um, because it did just sort of feel like there was all this hullabaloo getting in 
and then leaving it was like, okay, see ya. Um, so that I think is, you know, um, one of the first things that there is no transition uh, for anyone. You don't like, when you go to Okinawa, you get a buddy. Uh, when you go to boot camp, you get a buddy. Uh, you get somebody who like goes with you around. Um, we should be doing that for veterans as they come home. Like we should have designated people who are with them to make sure that they're okay. Um, because many of them will come back without having anyone to connect to, or they decide, well, I was at Camp Lejeune, you know, for four years. So like Camp Lejeune is now my home. And meanwhile, they're from Ohio and they go to, back to Camp Lejeune and they don't really know anyone there, you know? Um, so there's that. The other thing is that if you do look at our history, um, and I know that we don't have time for a, like a deep lesson on this, um, the government has never really taken care of veterans when they've finished, right? When they've left war, um, in fact, at times benefits have been held back. Uh, people have not gotten the resources or the, you know, the services that they needed. Um, that problem perpetuates. Um, and what's kind of, uh, you know, painful to me is to know that often veterans are used sort of as like as a political pawn uh, in a way of sort of saying that we're for the veterans and you're not for the veterans, uh, when in reality, nobody is really actually taking care of anyone. Um, and, you know, we're seeing the ramifications of that in a world where, you know, um, suicide is more, you know, prevalent than maybe it was a number of decades ago. Um, I'm not sure if that exactly answered the question. Um, and I just, I just know that I, um, I have a number of friends that, you know, suffer from incredible PTSD, um, that are dealing with, you know, real challenging issues from the time that they served, uh, and they're not being given the time much in the way that young people need to be given the time to heal, you know? Thank you. Um, this has been great. I, I can't decide if we should keep going or <laughs> move on with the service. Are there anybody in the chat, Eric, have a question? Or Okay, maybe we'll end it there. Thank you, Michael, Thank you. so much. Sure. Um, now, please join in singing hymn number 1018, Come and Go With Me, in your teal hymnal. Please stand as you're able.
I invite you to join me in extinguishing the chalice. You can find the affirmation in our order of service. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. For these we carry in our hearts until we are together again. And for the closing words, we'll also consult the UU hymnal number 677. I'll, I'll read these words for us. So I guess you don't have to turn, but if you want to read along, 677. The peace which passeth understanding, the peace of God, which the world can neither give nor take away, be among us and abide in our hearts. Now for the postlude. <laughs>